By the way, we're on uh, we're on 14. Bless uh, you. Yeah, we're on 14.1. And we're going to learn how to make, uh, do some genetic engineering here. When is the test? Okay. Okay. Test on this November is 7th. Next Wednesday. Yes, next Wednesday. So it's chapter. Woden's Day. What? Woden's Day. Woden? Woden. Woden. God Woden. The Norse god Woden. Oh. He's the god of... Of all gods. I think he's the father of the Norse gods. Is that right? Oh, yeah. That's his day. Woden's day. Wednesday. Yeah. Thor's day is Thursday. So exciting. Thor's day is Thursday. Frigg's day is Friday. But enough about names of days. Let's talk about how they make glowing fit. It's biotechnology. It is. It's biotechnology. We can actually, we now have the tools to move DNA from one organism to another. In this particular case, they took a jellyfish gene that coded for a glowing protein. And they cut the jellyfish gene out of the jellyfish DNA and put it in a fish egg. And that fish egg cell could glow. And guess what? That fish egg cell multiplied and multiplied and became a whole fish that could glow. Have you seen the movie Splice? I've not seen the movie Splice. I've heard it's really, it's really weird and not very scary so I don't, but I do want to watch it. Jurassic Park, they did this sort of thing. So, how does this work? Well, basically uh, we need to understand the tools, the, the tools that scientists use here. And I want to get out of this. Hold on. That was from the regular bio class. I haven't quite finished this. And okay, so what we can do is we can take a human cell. And they can obtain a human cell a lot of ways. They can do a skin scrape, or take some hair, or the swab the inside of your mouth, or take some blood. They get human cells in a lot of different ways. And there's a human cell. And then they remove one of the chromosomes out of the human cell. And you know what a chromosome is, right? Fold it up. It's a long strand of DNA all coiled up. So they take out this long strand of DNA. And somewhere in the DNA is the gene for making a human protein that they're interested in. Now, the first time that this was ever done, it was done by a company called Eli Lilly. And they, they took the insulin gene. Do y'all, have y'all ever heard of a person who is a diabetic? My cousin. Your cousin's a diabetic? She takes shots of insulin. Yeah. So here's the deal. See, your cousin doesn't make insulin correctly. Neither do I. Are you diabetic? No, I'm insulin resistant. Oh, really? Okay. Well, a person who's diabetic isn't making insulin correctly. And so what they have to do, they have to take shots of insulin. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what, what insulin does. After you eat, you eat a bunch of food, the food gets into your digestive system, and sugars come, go into your blood. And so you have really high blood sugar after you eat. Normal people have a pancreas that's sitting right about here that squirts out insulin. And the insulin tells your liver to suck up the sugar and store it. And so very shortly after you eat, insulin is released, and then the liver sees that insulin or, or feels that insulin and then knows to suck sugar out of the blood. And the sugar stored in the liver. So you don't have as high blood sugar. So the blood sugar goes back down. But if you're a diabetic, you eat, your blood sugar goes way up, you don't produce any insulin, and your blood sugar just stays real high. And then, and, and, and when your blood sugar is too high, you got all kinds of problems because the heart has trouble pumping blood around the body. Can't you just have high and, blood sugar and you're just like old? Yeah, you could, yeah. There's other ways to have high blood sugar. But, Another problem is then what will end up happening 
is, is you got to get rid of all that sugar in your blood somehow, so your body ends up peeing it out. As a matter of fact, the old test to see if someone was diabetic before they invented modern tests was, you'd pee in a cup and the doctor would taste it. Are you serious? And if it was sweet, he knew you had diabetes. Uh-uh. Oh. Yes, huh? My. That was dangerous. That's what they make the big cat. Of course, if you're diabetic, it would taste good. It'd be nice and sweet. But if they weren't, that was... And they'd go, fill that back up for me. since they don't make their own insulin, is they have to buy insulin and inject themselves with it two or three times a day. And that controls their blood sugar levels. Here's the bad part. <coughs> One, insulin's pretty expensive. It's normally derived from pig and cattle blood, pigs and cattle that they slaughter for meat. And a lot of people are allergic to pig and cattle insulin. And those people are in trouble because they can't take it and they just die from diabetes. Or they have to get it somehow from human blood, which is a lot more difficult to do. And there's there's all kinds of problems. Is type one or type two worse? Type, type one is the kind you're born with. Type two is the kind you get if you're if you're kind of a big person and need to. Neither you don't want either one of them. Um, so anyway, so what this company, Eli Lilly, did is they said, let's take the gene for insulin and cut it out of a human cell. And so right here, they're showing right here this purple thing, that's the insulin gene. It's on one of the human chromosomes, and of course there's 46 human chromosomes, and one of them has a gene for making insulin on it. Actually, there's two genes for making insulin on each of the homologous pairs. Right? You got one gene from your dad and one gene so two, on two of the chromosomes, there'll be information for making insulin. And they came up with a way to cut that gene out of the DNA. And what it is, is they use an enzyme. It's called a restriction enzyme. And so that's this yellow thing right here. This yellow thing is a restriction enzyme. Yes, that's what cuts... This, this is a molecule, it's a protein, it's an enzyme, that can cut DNA. It's, it's, it's sometimes called DNA scissors. The restriction, the restriction enzyme is called DNA scissors. And the particular restriction enzyme that they were working with here in this example was called ECOR1. What, what exactly does the restriction enzyme do? It cuts DNA. For what purpose? That's a good question, Cole. I like I like your questions. Have I ever told you that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are down. restriction enzymes enzyme scissors? Is that what yes. you said? They cut DNA. They're and DNA they're scissors. Here's where you find them. You find them in bacteria. Because bacteria are often invaded by viruses. You ever heard of viruses? Viruses are infective little creatures that can inject their DNA into you. And if a little bacteria gets a virus land on them and injects DNA in them, the, the, it's going to kill the bacteria. But the bacteria has a defense. The bacteria has restriction enzymes inside of it. And the restriction enzymes will cut up the viral DNA. And these, these geneticists found that they could remove those restriction enzymes from the bacteria and use them. So that was a good question, Paul. How does the, why does the body accept the restriction enzymes? Well, they don't even do this inside the body. No. They do this in a test tube. Just with one cell? Yeah, well, they'll, take, they'll actually take more than one cell. They'll take a bunch of human cells, and they'll actually put them in a blender. And, or, and, and give them some chemicals, and that'll make the chromosomes spill out. And you can't even see it, but it's just happening in a test tube. And then they drop in a bunch of the restriction enzymes into the test tube, and the restriction enzymes start cutting away. Now this particular restriction enzyme, ECOR1, it looks for a specific genetic sequence 
And that sequence that ECOR1 looks for is GAA TTC. GATSI. And whenever ECOR1 sees GATSI, it'll snip. It'll make a cut on the DNA. Do I see a GATSI up there? You see any GATSIs? Yes. Yes. There's a Gatsy right there. There it is. We're going to cut this thing in just a second. Let me tell you about GAATTC. It's called a palindrome. Have you ever heard that word before, palindrome? Same way forwards and backwards. Reads the same way, forward and backwards, like mom. Yeah. Hannah. Hannah. Race car. Race car. Radar. That's a good one. Radar. What's that sentence Dad. that's like? Dad. The cat. I. Ah, it's one letter, y'all. It does. It reads the same forward and backwards. That was a joke. Laugh at the joke. Uh, Thank you, Jessica. Didn't you didn't laugh at all? <laughs> what, what were you saying, Caitlin? I'm sorry. There's like a sentence that's like the same backwards, like the cat something. Oh really? Fox. It's like rattle. Like, that's like the fox one has every, every letter. letter. Ah. Yeah. 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 These are all interesting things, and you look at this and you go, Mr. Willis. That doesn't read the same forward and backwards. But remember the side that's connected to that? What connects the C? G. What connects the T? A. 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 Do it all together as a class. G. 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 Okay, that was pretty lame, but we'll continue. G A T G C? G A T G C in the opposite direction. So what the Eco R1 does is it goes down, reading the letters, and when it sees G-A-A-T-T-C, it'll make a cut. And it'll make a cut right there, right between the G and the A. Now, scientists don't just have one restriction enzyme, they have a bunch. And so this ECOR1 goes down this way, in the three prime to five prime direction, reading and cutting, and another ECOR1 is going up the other side in the three prime to five prime direction, reading and cutting. And so one will cut here, and another one will cut there, and man, that will just come right up in there, just like that. Yes? Um, do they always start from 3 prime and go to 5 prime? Yes. Always? Mm -hmm. That's just the way these things read. And so, so we, we make a cut, and this is actually a jagged cut. Scientists like to use restriction enzymes that make jagged cuts. Not all restriction enzymes do. Some of them cut straight across. But a lot of them make jagged cuts because what we create here is something that's scientifically called a sticky end. That's the name of this. Because this TTAA that's sticking out will stick to an AATT. And these two things are likely to stick back together unless you have it at a hot enough temperature where they won't come back together. They're moving too fast. And so if we continue reading down here, G-A-A-T-T-C, bam. It always cuts after the And bam, yep, yeah, it always cuts between the G and the A. And now what we've done is we've cut this piece out of the chromosome. So if we find something like C-T-T-A-A-G, it'll cut that out too. Wait, I don't see how that's G-A-A-T-T-C. On this side? I don't understand this. G A A T T C. You see that, right? Yeah. See it going in the reverse direction. G A A T T C on the other side. So it cuts out. It reads this way going this way and this way going this way. So if it comes across with the C T T A A G, uh, it'll cut that out as well. No, it only cuts G A A T T C. It's got to get that six-letter sequence. Okay. And that's where it cuts. Yes. The top and bottoms come together. Like a puzzle. Yeah, they cut together. Well, we don't care about the human DNA anymore. We don't. So now we have this human gene because between the two cuts, there are a bunch of letters, and this isn't as long as it really would be, but imagine a thousand letters in here. That's the gene for making insulin. The insulin gene is between where the two cuts were made. 
It just so happens that there's a GAATTC sequence above and below the insulin gene. So this only happens with insulin? This is how they got the insulin gene out of the human DNA. What year was this? In the early 80s. Mm -hmm. They've been doing this about 30 years, and they're a lot better at it now than they used to be. Are y'all with me here still? So now we got this insulin gene. What are we going to do with it? Well, they then take a little loop of DNA that's found in bacteria, and I'll draw it up on the board here. We call this loop of DNA that's found in a bacteria, we call it a plasmid. And they show a bacterium here. This bacteria is called E. coli. Are you getting this? And you see the little loop of DNA there? Okay, that's the bacterial chromosome. But there's also loops of DNA inside bacteria. And they're showing it way bigger than it actually is. It would actually be much smaller than and the chromosome. There a lot of them? There's a bunch of them. They're called plasmids. And so what the scientists do is they remove the plasmid, they cut the insulin gene out with the restriction enzyme, just like I just showed you. They cut open the plasmid with the same restriction enzyme. So the ECOR1 is put onto the plasmids, also in a test tube. The ECOR1 cuts at GAATTC. Bam, it'll make a cut. And on that side too. And this plasma comes open. It opens up, you see. And then scientists take a bunch of these that they've cut previously. And, and drop them in the test tube with a bunch of these that they've cut open. So, and so wait, what, won't the restriction enzyme go back and cut it, it again? Or did they just kind of like... After they like cut a certain strand of DNA, did they just kind of like stop? It's talking about the restricting... restricting this restriction enzyme? Yeah, restriction enzyme. Is it going to cut somewhere else, you mean? Yes. There's no other place to cut. There's no, no other like, TAATTCs. After the eco AR, whatever you call that, um, eco R1. Yeah, eco R1. After that's done cutting like a hole, what are the um, back and then again? they put those insulin strands back in there. Yeah. And they connect. Um, yeah, and these are gonna connect. And then, but what happens after that? Will, will eco uh, R1 come back? Will it recut? Yeah. That's a good question. Maybe they probably strain these out of the test tube. Does, um, or spin it out. What you can do is you can spin your sample around. The heavy stuff goes to the bottom and the light stuff stays in the centrifuge. Mm -hmm. And so if you spun these things around, these would be lighter than this. And so they'd stay at the top and you could get rid of all that so it doesn't recut. I don't know how they do it. I'm just guessing. Okay, so that's... But that's a, that would be one way to do it. Yes? So where does the orange thing come from? This? Yes. This orange thing is this plasmid that they've taken out of the bacteria, and now they've cut it open with the restriction enzyme. So it's, it's a little loop of DNA that you find in the bacteria. So it's random. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's in the bacteria for a purpose. It tells the bacteria to do something. But we're not interested in what its purpose is in the bacteria. Where we're going to put some human DNA in there. Oh, so we put the DNA in the bacteria. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to take this plasmid, Cut it open. Take the human insulin gene. Jessica, you getting all this? Yes. Take the human insulin gene and put it in there. And all you really have to do is mix the two together in a test tube, and these molecules bounce around, and eventually one attaches, and the other end attaches. And then you put, there's an extra enzyme that you have to put in there to tie it in. It's called DNA ligase. We've actually seen this DNA ligase enzyme before. It was the one that put together the Okazaki fragments. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. DNA ligase is just a special enzyme that ties DNA together. And that's what you put in. If you drop that in your test tube, the DNA ligase ties these things together.
together and binds these end pieces here, binds them together tightly and forms a covalent bond there. So now we have a new piece of DNA that has information from humans and information from bacteria. This type of DNA with a combination of two organisms of genes is called recombinant DNA. So we are combining the human gene for insulin with bacterium DNA? That's it. What, what's, what's the purpose of that? Uh, we're going to get there. We're not there yet. So what's created is recombinant DNA? Recombinant DNA is DNA that has at least two species instructions. We call this whole type of technology recombinant DNA technology. It's exciting, isn't it, Dante? Yeah. So, here we have the insulin gene. We're putting it into the plasmid, and now we have our plasmid. Are you ready? You gotta keep following this. What are we gonna do with this plasmid? Well, we put the plasmid into a bacteria. A new bacteria? A new bacteria. There's, there's so many trillions of bacteria in the test tube that we don't care which one it goes into. Bacteria are easy to find. And this is, so this is, you're just like restating what we just did, right? Oh, no. yeah. You yeah, I'm, I'm doing it here and showing you there. Okay. Okay. So they just do it to make a lot of insulin, right? Uh, Cool. What do you say? Again? So here, yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen. We put the plasmid into the bacterium. Now there's instructions for making human insulin inside this bacterium. And this bacterium can make insulin. And this bacterium is stupid. It doesn't know what it's doing. And it starts reading these instructions and making insulin through transcription and translation. And it'll just start spitting out this insulin protein. And it doesn't need the insulin, so the insulin just diffuses out of its body. And so, as you see, if we continue here, this cell, if you feed it, it will multiply, copying itself. And you go from one bacteria that makes insulin to a trillion bacteria that make insulin in just a few days. A trillion bacteria making insulin is a powerful insulin making machine. How does the first one start? Like, how does it know insulin in the first place? It's, this is DNA instructions. So, just like I taught you before, transcription and translation, that automatically happens here. The RNA polymerase binds, transcribes the gene at the ribosome, the insulin is made. So, so the, the bacteria doesn't think about what it's instructions are, it just carries out its instructions. So it's a protein. Insulin is a protein. Yeah. But so what exactly are the, so the bacteria already has all the materials to make insulin? Yes, the bacteria, insulin is just a protein. Oh, okay. Where's my protein? Insulin is just one of these. So, like, what so bacteria it? can make proteins, it's just got to put the amino acids together in the right order, then you got insulin. What if it was like a, you put in like a code for something that it didn't have the materials to make. If it's a protein, it's got the materials okay. to make it. Is there anything that like's not a protein that cell doesn't have? No, usually it just makes proteins. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's like I'm, like I'm thinking like humans, like like in your diet, like in health class, there's like essential amino, amino acids, acids and protein. some that you don't have. Yeah. Now that if if the bacteria is lacking some of the amino acids, it may not be able to construct the protein. So you got to make sure the bacteria has plenty, has all the amino acids. So you got to feed the bacteria. Same with humans. We have to Same with humans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the bacteria squirt insulin out of their bodies because they don't need it. It just diffuses out, and they grow these bacteria in huge containers, and. They sift out the insulin from the containers and bottle it and sell it. Jeez. And it's human insulin, so no one's allergic to it. What about the bacteria? Well, they strain it out through a screen. So the insulin can get through the screen, but the bacteria can't. So 
why doesn't everyone have that? It's expensive. Because everyone doesn't have diabetes, not everyone needs. Well, yeah. But We're all making our own insulin. Is that like super expensive more than like the cow? Whatever? It's actually cheaper than the cow and pig insulin. But well, why don't we? Yeah, why would you buy the cow and pig insulin if you had? Diabetes? Some places don't have. They they can only produce so much. This little company. Uh, That's only one company. Only one company is doing it now. They have the, the rights to it. Oh, uh, they would not have rights to it. Well, wait, so they're making... Oh, they're uh, now you're getting into law. Let's so let's not go into the legal like, discussion. But what do you... Wait, uh, Lee had his hand up. Um, if they can figure out how to make, like, get bacteria to make insulin, why can't they figure out how to get bacteria to make, like, sugar so that we... Can they can. They're using this process to make all sorts of things. So yeah, only the people at this company figured this out, and they're not sharing it with anyone. So what if someone now, else, I don't know that for sure. They might have shared it. What if someone else figures it out? And what do we have food They already have the they have like a patent to it. on it. What's, oh, it's like it? if somebody came out with your story after you got it. Well, they didn't, they didn't like make that. That's a whole legal, there's there's a whole ethical, uh, the ethics of genetics and all that. That's, that's a whole, that is a whole branch of law. Didn't you Why say you, you can go into that. Why do we not? You get, a, you get a degree in biology and a law degree. And you can specialize in those kinds of cases. They, they're, they're, they're trying those That's cases all the time. But what about that guy that got the credit? Who has the rights to what? What about that guy that got the credit for the Nobel Prize thing when he didn't even come up with it? Yeah, what's up with that? Yeah, what's up with that? That's a really bad thing. That's not fair. Really? Actually, he did kind of help. Wait, so why do we have food issues if we have bacteria that comes up with making because only one company is producing that. The bacteria they don't so they will share the food issues. secret with everyone yeah, else. Yeah, so we have bacteria that can create, like, sugar. So why do we still have some food issues? Like what food, food lack of Like fire. starvation yeah. and stuff? That's a UI thing. Well, I don't think the bacteria can make sugar any faster than the plants can make sugar. Well, I mean, but, for instance, they're working on all sorts of applications of this. Here, here's, here's a for instance. You know what the strongest material in the world is? Hard carbon fiber. Well, that is, that is strong, but the strongest naturally made material is, uh, is spider web. And, you know, if, if you could get enough spider web material, if, if I were to weave a shirt made out of spider web, well, it would be bulletproof, and it would be tough. And man, wouldn't that be great to have on all your soldiers? Would it be Wait, light? how is it? It would be light. It's like 20 times stronger than steel. And so, gosh, if you could just get enough spiderweb material, well, spiderweb material is hard to find. It's, it's super expensive. You can't get a spider. You can't, and you can't, you can't uh, farm spiders either because they eat each other. You can't grow a bunch of spiders in one place. They, they don't like one another. So what the scientists did was they removed the gene for making spider webs and put it in bacteria, and now they got bacteria producing the spider web material, and you can make huge amounts of it. Well, then why are they doing it? They're well, they're doing it right why now. They're working on it. They're trying to figure it out. And then and pretty soon you, you make you make this you make this uh, vest out of spider web material that's way stronger than a Kevlar vest. But then they'll make bullets out of spider web. <laughs> there you go. I don't, I don't know if that's possible. That's good though. That's pretty. Wait, I don't get how there. spider webs are so strong. It's, it's just their the molecular structure of the spider web. So how you can break them? Strong. Yeah, like because it's, it's so, so thin. Tiny. But if you had like a like, like bunch of if you had enough spider web, you wouldn't be able to break it. That's awesome. I wonder that's if spiders spider know that. Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be like awesome. scary. I don't think spiders. Yeah, I wonder if they know that. How much power they have. <laughs> Let me show you a little video. You can your own bulletproof. You can't crush me. Algae. <laughs> What's that? Like they're making gasoline and things like that with like algaes and things like that. Have you heard about that? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's a different process. That's not necessarily genetic engineering. Um, but to, there's some genetic engineering involved in that. You're right. Um, but, uh, hold on. Where were you in this picture, by the way? That was in the Galapagos. Galapagos. That guy in a little coat. That guy in a little coat. A movie. Tommy, Tommy. Tommy, Tommy boy. Tommy boy. I thought it was, yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was Tommy. That guy in a little coat. No, it's Tommy boy. What did it say? Fat guy in a little coat. Fat guy in a little coat. I thought he said that guy is a little cold. No. I heard cold. I heard Tommy Boy. Yeah. 
recombinant DNA technique using a plasmid vector, foreign DNA is spliced into a bacterial plasmid. The recombined plasmid then carries the foreign DNA into a bacterial cell, where it is cloned when the cell reproduces. If the foreign DNA contains a gene for insulin production, each transgenic cell will make insulin. Okay, let me back that up because they did that real fast. Here is, here's the original bacterium with its one looped chromosome, and here are the little, these little blue things are the little plasmids. And they're actually, uh, they're actually smaller than it's showing here. You remove a plasmid, you cut it open with restriction enzymes, you put in your gene for insulin. Yeah, you have recombinant DNA now. You put this recombined recombinant DNA into some other bacterium. Can it not be the same one? It can be a different one. And then that cell will multiply, and all these cells will be capable of making insulin. We say that the bacteria is cloning itself when it's multiplying because bacteria make identical copies of themselves. So that's a form of cloning a gene. We're making many copies of this insulin gene through the bodies of bacteria. So and cool. you can see the insulin just floating away, the purple stuff. That's awesome. I really, I don't understand how people, like, come up with this stuff. Yeah, well, once you understand how it works, you can figure it out. People figured it out. Scientific uh, Scientists begin with a cell from one organism. This shows you the actual one company. One of the chromosomes is a gene they are interested in isolating. They put the cell in solution. The cell wall ruptures. The chromosomes fill out. Molecular biologists then use restriction enzymes to cut the gene of interest out of the chromosome. The scientists can then transfer the gene to another organism. One organism commonly used because it is well understood is a bacterium called Escherichia coli. In addition to having its own chromosomes, E. coli, like most other bacteria, have small loops of DNA called plasmids. Scientists can remove a plasmid, cut it apart, and then chemically do the selected gene into the plasmid. The plasmid can be put back into the bacterium, which will go on living its life, duplicating itself with one important difference. Each new bacterial cell now contains genetic information from two organisms. If scientists splice a human gene into the bacterial plasmid, the new generation of E. coli will be able to make a human protein. This basic technique of genetic engineering has many applications. At Eli Lilly and Company in Indianapolis, the first genetically engineered drug approved for human use is being produced. Here, scientists isolate the portion of the human genetic information that regulates blood sugar. They take the human genes, insert them into E. coli, and use that genetically engineered bacterium to produce a human protein, insulin. A technician is spreading the altered bacteria onto a medium. In order not to contaminate the sample, he's working at a lab station with an overhanging ventilated hood. Given time, the E. coli will reproduce, forming a number of individual colonies. The technician chooses a single colony, which will become the parent of an entire batch of insulin. To make enough human insulin for commercial purposes, Eli Lilly must encourage the bacteria to duplicate themselves many millions of times. As the culture grows, it is transferred to larger and larger containers, ultimately reaching computer-controlled fermentation tanks.
insulin is chemically separated from the E. coli. Purified, quality tested, made into a solution in huge vats, and then under sterile conditions, bottled for sale.
This was 14.1. I didn't talk about everything in 14.1. I'll try and talk about it tomorrow. But this next part is DNA fingerprinting. Have you ever heard that, like a crime scene? Mm -hmm. Where they run the, the DNA through a gel and they can tell who did the crime. I'll show you how that works tomorrow. And we do a lab. We do this at one of our labs. It's coming right up. You can see the little lines of the code to tell you. Oh, yeah, I know. I've seen that. You've seen that before? And they drive, CSI. One, they drive one to the other and if they have them, they're going to stop this now. Yeah, yeah, you can stop it. 